congratulations on the show. Thank you very much. It's, uh, it's doing quite well. How does your odd couple different differ from the prior incarnations of the show? It's a play. It was a movie. It was a, a sitcom. It was a play again with women. Then there was a, <laughs> uh, an African-American uh, version. And then there was a Saturday morning cartoon with the voices of Tony Randall and Jack Klugman. I as don't remember that. They, they took, I think, the original audio and made it a, uh, a cartoon. Um, so it has been, it's certainly been covered pretty well before. You know, this was, a, it was a big thing that I thought about um, heading into it. I, I, I got a call. They said, you know, Matthew Perry uh, wants to be Oscar in The Odd Couple and he's looking for a Felix. And it was one of those times where you just get a lot of perspective about yourself. And I realized, oh, damn it. Yeah, that's pretty much exactly the kind of person I am. I'm persnickety. I, I, you know, I do yoga. I practice the cello, you know. Um, so it was one of those, um, like in Spinal Tap, when they say a little, a little bit too much perspective. I got a little bit too much perspective on myself. But, you know, I, I did wonder if it was even attemptable to do because Tony Randall was hanging over me like the sort of Damocles sort of. And, you know, what I, what I thought was, you know, if Tony Randall had been uh, all wrapped up uh, in his head about the Jack Lemmon performance, we wouldn't have the Tony Randall performance. Right. So, you know, I, I, I thought I could bring something new to the character. And the way I look at it is a lot of people refer to it as that we were doing a, you know, a remake of the 70s TV show. And what I don't consider that we're remaking that show. In my mind, what got me excited about it was playing Felix Unger and playing Oscar Madison, the Neil Simon characters, and, and sort of taking them into new places. So that was the, the way that I wrapped my head around it. And, and I feel like there's a lot new, but I also feel like there's a lot of homage to the old one, honestly. So it's not, we didn't really reinvent anything. We're just an extension of those Neil Simon characters, I feel like. Well, I think you have to have touchstones. If you don't have the touchstones, mm -hmm. and it's not the odd couple, mm -hmm. but if it's just the old show, people mm -hmm. of my age will go, I've seen this before. Right. You know, it's interesting, the pilot, the very first episode is probably closest to the play, and it has a, a joke in it that was actually written by Neil Simon when he yeah. says, uh, uh, pick up your socks, F you, we're out of cornflakes, F you. And he <laughs> says, it took me three days to realize F you meant Felix Unger. <laughs> and it was amazing because it's a 60-year-old joke. Yeah. And we almost couldn't get it on the air on television. Is you, that right? Apparently you're not quite allowed to say that. <laughs> not yet, anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Um, what was your first exposure to it? Was it the the, the original show, or did you see it? Uh, My, you, you, know, you grew up in Chicago. I grew up right? in Chicago, so every Broadway show started there on previews. But so. uh, we, you know, I'd never seen the I'd never seen the play as a kid. But uh, the the Tony Randall Jack Klugman version when I was a boy was already in reruns. Right. So that was the the one that I watched religiously when we we used to watch a lot of television back in the 70s on a tiny black and white screen yeah, yeah. <laughs> we had an actual black and white tv <laughs> for a long time my dad worked at an art museum and we uh we uh had the, really the cheapest tv you could probably get right. and so um yeah tony randall loomed very very large that was uh that that was the version of the show that's most stuck in my head yeah. and i guess you can't really go back and revisit because you don't want that you, you, uh, it's good to have the memories of it it's exactly the shards what happened. of memory it's exactly but you can't go back I, and have it i wanted more. to be so careful as we went into it i i very actively did not watch any of the tony randall stuff because i i knew the second i see him he's so brilliant i'm going to just start mimicking him. Yeah. I'm just going to try to be him. And uh, so I really made an effort not to. <laughs> Although I ran into his um, his widow recently. Oh. And uh, it was interesting. She came and said hello to me. And uh, uh, she introduced herself to me. And she said, I'm Tony Randall's widow. And this is Tony Randall's son. And I was, it was very, um, one of those weird serendipitous moments. And I, I promised her that I would try not to ruin the franchise. Yeah. Because <laughs> they still get some nice royalties, I know. That's right. Yeah. Now, there is a connection to the old show other than the 60-year-old joke and uh, the, the characters coming forth and things. It's Gary Marshall. Gary Marshall, this is a fascinating thing. Gary Marshall, TV producer extraordinaire, yeah. Happy Days, Laverne and Shirley, Mork and Mindy, <clears throat> all the, any show with and in it, he, he invented. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, I had no idea that he was going to be involved at all. Yeah. And the first time I came to the very first table read of the pilot script, 
I saw that there was a parking space reserved for Gary Marshall. And I immediately started having a panic attack. You know, because I was just like, wait a second. I'm, not only am I going to be playing Felix Unger, I'm going to be doing Felix Unger for the man who turned the play into a TV show the first time, and he was sitting two feet in front of me. So it was incredibly daunting. Uh, and it was, it's funny, I, I didn't really think he'd be involved. I thought, you know, it'd be one of those things where somebody puts their name on something and they yeah. stamp it and, you know. Which happens all the time. It happens all the time. Gary Marshall's at every live audience taping. He stands right next to the cameras. He's got jokes for me that he's pitching. He's got <laughs> notes for me of things that I can improve. <laughs> he's he's uh, incredibly hands-on. And uh, uh, it was the first time I, I got a lot of confidence to doing the role was when uh, Gary came up and hugged me. He said, you're killing it. <laughs> um, and I hope he meant you're I think in, he I think he meant it in a good in, way. In a good way. It seemed like right. he meant it in a good way. <laughs> he's a lovely man, though. I understand. I've not met him. But I understand that, you know, he's he's uh, outgoing, friendly, lovely guy. He's a mensch yeah. is the, the, <clears throat> the classic word for what he is, is a mensch. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And you're working with Matthew Perry. Mm-hmm. You had guested on Friends. Mm-hmm. Uh, are you, did you have a relationship with him outside of uh, professionally? It was interesting. When I guested on Friends, it was at the very height of Friends. Mm. So none of the Friends really said hello. <laughs> <laughs> It was that sort of rich to say it was hello? that stretch of friends where nobody was <laughs> chatty. Uh, so I went. Uh, I didn't really meet any of the friends on two weeks of friends. Uh, then got to know Matthew on Seventeen again, which right. was a film that we did. Was that guy? Um, one of those sort of Freaky Friday type movies, and uh, we we did we do have a sort of instant chemistry. And uh, I'd be lying if I didn't say that I think. Part of what makes us work so well is that I bug him just about 15 to 25 percent of the time. I'm legitimately getting on his nerves just just enough that it keeps the relationship vibrant. In, in what way? Um, well, you know, I'm a pretty persnickety. I mean, he's a very laid back bachelor. Right. You know, he's he, Canadian as well. He is a Canadian gentleman. Uh, he uh, although everyone actually thinks I'm Canadian and I have figured out why. It's because I'm polite. Ah. Well, That's I'm into, right. I'm very into Rush, right? And I'm polite, <laughs> and those are two two telltale signs that you might you, you might, might be Canadian. Yes, yeah, or, uh, or at least have a Canadian relative who you who raised you or something like that. Yeah. And people every single day of my life, someone says "kids in the hall" to me. So, <laughs> side note: I am not in the kids in the hall. No, you're not but, Dave Foley. But, uh, not I'm not Dave Foley, <laughs> but I'm friends with Dave Foley now. Yeah. Uh, I totally forgot the question. The question was, oh, uh, working with Matthew. Yeah, and uh, well, and how do you bug him? Uh, oh, just, um, I mean, the, the, the Felixisms about me are, you know, are pretty accurate, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and he's he's an incredibly laid back person, and right. I'm much more a type A, right. um, um, tightly wound yes. person. I'm not sure if you can tell that. You probably can. <laughs> Fairly tightly wound. But you're uh, very busy, I, when it, I was surprised to see you taking on a weekly television show, we, where you've had before Reno Nine One One, we've seen you know we, we've seen you do this sort mm-hmm. of work before. But you're a very busy writer, mm-hmm. uh, writing movies, Night at the Museum, mm-hmm. Hell Baby, all sorts of. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's ten or twelve big scripts mm-hmm. that you've had produced. Uh, you act. In Thank film. you for the shout out for Hell Baby because that movie opened on in some five. Act- <laughs> it opened on five screens. <laughs> I have the most schizophrenic career. If you were to look through my IMDb credits, it looks like someone took like a bowl. If you're playing a game of like celebrity password (laughs) and took an insane sampling of titles, I I, I, even I don't understand my career. I'm in two Merchant Ivory films. I'm in two Christopher Nolan films. But then I'm also in Boat Trip for some reason. (laughs) I, I cannot get a handle what is what is my agenda? I don't know what I'm getting at. No, the, the answer is I. Uh, you have to do a lot of different things. Right. So many things. If you're in the movie business, ninety percent of the things you will attempt will fall apart. Right. Is it's I'd say pretty accurate for for the studio screenwriting. Uh, my my partner Robert Ben Garant and I. At one point we figured it out, and I, for us we've had a lot of films made, about mm-hmm. a dozen. Which is a lot. I mean, mm-hmm. it, to put that in perspective, mm-hmm. um, a, a successful screenwriter mm-hmm. often might have three scripts, four mm-hmm. scripts produced in a career. You mm-hmm. script doctor, you mm-hmm. do other things, but you don't mm-hmm. typically get your mm-hmm. name on a credit on unless you're 
William mm-hmm. Goldman or I don't mm-hmm. know who else. You don't get your name on 10, 12, 13. No, it's, it's super unlikely. Um, granted, some of those uh, films are egregious turkeys, but... <laughs> <laughs> this is this is the business. You know, they don't they, they don't always work out. But uh, to basically to get uh, one film made in our experience, and this is not I'm not talking about spec scripts. Yeah. You really need to write about eight films. If you write eight scripts, right. there's a chance. There's probably a thirty percent chance that one of them of those eight will get made. Wow. So it, it just I mean it, it's an insane system. The movies fall apart for. The natural state of movies is basically falling apart. Yeah, yeah. So uh, we actually we wrote an entire book about it called Writing Movies for Profit, mm-hmm. um, which is basically about how to survive in the studio system. It's not really a writing. We can't really, you can't teach anyone how to write, but you can teach how to survive the insane studio system. Where it's a very funny book as well. Thank you very much, yeah. but you'll be... I mean, I was, we were fired off of Night at the Museum three times. <laughs> you get fired off your own movie three times. And the, the book is about how to gracefully accept the insanity of the studio system, which is designed to make you crazy and doesn't love writers. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Writers are really... At you're, the... pretty, uh, you're pretty down on the totem pole. Yeah. You, will, you often find out you're fired off of a studio movie because the assistant uh, of some executive will call you and say, hey, could you send us a final draft copy of that script of yours? Because we only have a locked PDF, and we just want to kind of look at it. <laughs> right. And you're like, oh, great news. Yeah. We're fired. Should I bring mm-hmm. it in in person? No. Yeah. No, 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 no. In fact, not only that, you will not be let on the lot, so don't <laughs> even try. Yeah. Um, getting back to uh, uh, The Odd Couple, which airs on CTV Thursday nights at 8.30, uh, you, playing Felix, um, you're, you've brought the cello is mm-hmm. your innovation, mm-hmm. I think. But that was real life, right? It's a, the, your that's my cello. Yeah, cello that's my three quarter size cello. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That um, you know, at one point we were working on the pilot, and they said uh, it just said, you know, uh, Felix is reading a magazine, mm. uh, and the and I thought that's just not Felixy enough. You know, like it needs to be much more Felixy. Yeah. So, uh, and then in, in, in the pilot also it said, you know, Felix is doing like a downward dog yoga pose. And I was like, that's not Felixy enough. Right. It needs to be like an upside down temple pose. So I'm trying to to uh, take it to extremes yeah. whenever I can. Yeah. <laughs> and the extremes are just the truly lame parts of myself. So, <laughs> and, and is it difficult for you as a writer and a very successful one, when you get the script, so you've got your new odd couple script, to stop yourself from walking past the writer's room and saying, fellas, listen, this no. is good stuff, but... Well, we're very, very blessed because we have um, a lot of the writing staff from the show Frasier. Right. Uh, we've got Bob Daly and Dan O'Shannon and Emily Cutler and, and a really... Um, if you're assembling like a an all-star team of sitcom writers, yeah. that's what we have. So... Um, I'm always delighted when I get the scripts. I, you know, I try to add little nuances of myself uh, and and improvise here and there. Like in the pilot, uh, I'm, I'm, I get my Enya reference in. I say, I've got an entire slideshow set to the music of Enya. Uh, and little things. And I'll, I'll, I'll do Felixisms. Like I, I try to, every time I enter the room, and they often cut these off, but I, I, I run in and say something that, that Felix would say. Um, like... Uh, You'll never guess which one of the three tenors I just saw, you know, and little <laughs> things like that. They, these frequently get cut out because right. the show's quite short. But uh, <laughs> I, I try to. It also just wakes me up to run into the room and say something. Well, and Felix you're performing say. in front of a live audience. That's the real joy. Uh, many people, uh, you, get, you get a lot of flack about the, uh, the quote-unquote laugh track of the show. We actually do shoot it in front of a live mm-hmm. audience. Um, so it, it's the fascinating thing is that it's very much like being in the play of the odd couple because right. every and for we shot for six months with no one but the live audience having seen the show so um, oh, it was a lot like being in a touring production of the odd couple that just was a new script each week yeah yeah and and how does it work do you do it a couple of times back to back or is it on show day you do it once and you might go back into a reshoot or something I'm not even sure how we, all that um, works. we generally do, you do each scene really not more than like maybe twice or right. three times occasionally. Um, but we try to run it as much like a play as as possible. We uh, Mark Sandrowski, who directs The Big Bang Theory, directs us also, right. and a guy named Phil Lewis, who are both really great live multi-camera sitcom directors. 
So, and it's also, one of the things we do is, if we do it again, we usually do something different. Mm -hmm. We don't, it's not really a repetitive process. So it, it, it's... It's very fun and improvisational. And are, are the writers on set? Always. And there's a little huddle that, that we all get in, Matthew and me and Gary Marshall, <laughs> and then the writers from <laughs> Frasier. It's a really fun thing to be in. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the shows are... I'm really proud of them. I mean, I was something that I was very daunted heading into, of whether or not it was attemptable, whether it was a good idea. And uh, the, the scripts were really outstanding. I think Matthew and I have a really nice chemistry. There's also, uh, there's a lot of other people in the show. Wendell Pierce, Lindsay Sloan, Yvette Nicole Brown. All of these people could be starring in their own TV shows, basically, right. and have. Yeah. So it's um, it's a really amazing uh, group of people. You can just pass the ball to anyone and you know they won't drop it. You know, right. it's nice. Yeah. And uh, Reno 911 had a, a slightly broader kind of comedic base, I think, or comedic mm -hmm. appeal. What do you think that the Reno 911 fans will think of The Odd Couple? Um, that's because an interesting... Because that show was ferocious. People yeah. love that mm -hmm. show. That sh we, the Reno 911 has a fanatical yeah. devotion between two kinds of people, recreational drug users <laughs> and the actual police. <laughs> Uh, those really? are the two, yeah. yes, and uh, law enforcement in general is, uh, uh, we got to do a lot of things uh, as a result of Reno 911. I, I sat on the president's helicopter in the Lieutenant Dangle outfit really? and shorts, yes, <laughs> yes I did. Um, so it, it opened a lot of doors, that, that show. Uh, you know, I think um, the, the Reno fans, we, you know, we, were, we did a lot of strange things on Reno that sometimes people noticed, sometimes people didn't even notice. I mean, that show was so like a stream of consciousness. We did an entire episode of Reno 911 that was inspired by Waiting for Gatto, the play. <laughs> and yes, I just said it the way you're supposed to say yes. it. I know it's annoying, but that is apparently the way you say it. Felix. So Waiting for Gatto. Um, and it was we were waiting for President Bush's motorcade to go by, but we were out in the desert and includes many references to the original play. And <laughs> it was like, where in the world are we ever going to have that opportunity again right. to do something so freeform? And th there was a reference. Literally, we did that in the show. No person has ever commented on it. <laughs> <laughs> it was just for us, apparently. It was We were spoofing uh, a very old... Uh, somewhat absurd play yeah. that no one needed us to spoof. But we got to do, I mean, we would do, you know, we we did, uh, we would shoot two hours of improvising a sketch called Who Pooped in the Book Donation Box, <laughs> which is uh, a great moment. Or we did one called Arby's Reenactment, <laughs> where um, we keep reenacting a, a crime scene that happens to be, uh, has a, a lot of Arby's food in it. <laughs> and... Uh, we we were really free. They know honestly. We never really got a note in in six in eighty eight episodes and a movie. Yeah, there was never really any notes, and I think you can tell. And I think you can also tell that nothing on that show was you know vetted by anybody. There was right. no committees. There was no nobody approved anything because you could never say the things that we were saying to each other. Right. Um, and we were a real group of friends and a legitimately diverse group of people, and. Uh, you know that one was, that was a really really great time. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, no, it was. A, it was. A, yeah. Now, the outfit did a lot of damage. Yeah. I would come home from Reno 911 days, and did you ever get in the shower and not realize that you have a lot of cuts on your body until the soap hits them? <laughs> Every day on Reno 911, I would get in the shower and realize my entire body, head to toe, was covered in like cuts and scrapes. I was basically wearing my underwear. Right. And then wrestling with Nick Swartzen in an alley <laughs> on roller skates. <laughs> and and where did the costume? Where was the inspiration for the costume? Did you come up with that, or, or the the Lieutenant Dangle shorts, which by the way is still a very popular Halloween costume, yeah. and I highly recommend it. You'll get a lot of you get a lot of pats on the butt if you wear it. Just if you're into that sort of thing, yeah. Just be ready for it because it's you'll get a lot of that. That's going to happen. Um, you know, I've been um, looking at. Uh, uh, Viggo Mortensen in the movie G.I. Jane. I don't know if you've seen it lately. Yeah, not but, lately. But. but the Navy SEALs in training, uh, first of all, he's got a beautifully sort of highlighted mustache in that film. Right. 
And then they wear the tightest plum smuggling shorts you have ever seen. <laughs> and these are the real Navy SEAL training shorts. They're really, really tight. So I, I just basically that was my the inspiration was Viggo Mortensen, G.I. Jane. Look it up. If you haven't seen it lately, you realize, oh, that's Lieutenant Dangloff. But basically. Uh, I, I think Viggo would be tickled by that. I think he would. I'm sure he would. <laughs> yeah. um, we talked about your work on uh, movies as a, as a screenwriter. And I wanted to ask you, uh, the films have made $1.4 billion mm-hmm. at the box office over, uh, over the years. Mm-hmm. Um, what movie did you write that turned out the least mm-hmm. like you planned? And what movie did, turned out the most? Oh, this is a fascinating. Um, the, there's two, the tie for the most, the first Night at the Museum film is very close to the script that we wrote. Um, but this is the double-edged sword of Hollywood. You ready for this? The other script that is word for word exactly what we wrote is the biggest flop of our entire careers. It almost took us out of the movie business. <laughs> it was a movie called Taxi. Oh, uh, Jimmy Fallon. Jimmy Fallon and, and Queen, Queen Latifah. Latifah. Okay, yeah. Thanks for remembering. Yeah. Um, but it was word for word. It was, couldn't have been more exactly what we wrote. And an epic, epic disaster. Um, it was one of those weird moments where we, uh, it actually, te- the movie tested through the roof for some reason. They tested Taxi and it just absolutely off the charts. People were high-fiving and they loved it. And then a couple days before the actual film came out, we got a call from the producer who was leaving the country for a little while. <laughs> and he said, you know, you guys might, you might just want to lay low for a little bit. <laughs> really? <laughs> because, yeah. <laughs> because you know what he said well a movie like this comes out and you're just going to be radioactive for a little while you're going to be re- <laughs> that wow. was the word he used was radioactive <laughs> uh so we got summoned into fox the following morning uh, after the the movie came out and they said uh, you need to pick something else to write and that ended up being night at the museum so yeah. so sometimes your your epic failures can lead to something nice well, but and and it kind of forced jimmy fallon out of the movie business so maybe the I, tonight show i'm waiting for that gift basket to thank little, me for that a little thank you note yeah <laughs> uh let's you know it's tough and then the one you know it, it's it's impossible to describe the studio writing system people literally wouldn't believe it but right. i mean you know we worked on the secret life of walter mitty and there were 16 years of drafts of scripts, <laughs> sixteen years, um, from writers that that were oh, of course, long, long, oh, of course, gone, long yeah. before you and long after you. And then, we, for example, we did not know we were there were six years of drafts of Night at the Museum before we came onto it. So it's it, it's a the disposable nature of writers in Hollywood is yeah. is something that people never can quite. And then when you you do get credit on something, you don't get credit on something. It's uh, you know, there's those ones you're like, hey, we got credit. And then there's a slight pause. You're like, oh, yikes. Did we want credit? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. We we positive we wanted our names on Herbie Fully Loaded, <laughs> which we, we did right. <laughs> you did right. Is, is there any uh, Alan Smithy equivalent for writers? So Alan Smithy mm-hmm. is a name that directors mm-hmm. can put on a project if mm-hmm. they feel that the movie, the finished movie, doesn't reflect their work. Is that is there something like that for writers? You know, I don't know that there is. I know I do know that if you do not put your name on it, you never get any royalties. So there's that. Mm-hmm. Oh, never. Yeah. yeah. So uh, sometimes you gotta. Yeah, you just, just gotta suck it up. up you gotta and, say, yeah. "I'm sorry, yeah. that was us." Um, <laughs> but the house in France needs a new <laughs> roof. <laughs> but we, we uh, it was funny. We got actually got fired off of Herbie Fully Loaded. We've been fired off every movie we've ever written on. That's the way it works. Yeah. But Herbie Fully Loaded, we got fired off of because uh, uh, an executive was like, "Okay," and then Herbie smiles. And we're like, Herb, when does Her- Herbie smiles? There's a car, like his whole bumper just goes like, Ring! like that's insane. That's going to be the scariest, weirdest thing. And we drew a line in the sand and we said, we will not make that car smile. Like he can bump people, his doors can open, he can like honk his lights, he can do Herbie-ish things, he'll make you fall in love. <laughs> but he can't, we're not going to make the literally the whole bumper of the car go and smile. So the answer is we were fired immediately. And if you look at the poster for Herbie Fully Loaded, he has the biggest smile on his face that you've ever seen. I don't know how that car is smiling. It's insane. He's he's made of liquid metal or something. He's made of liquid yeah. metal, and he's in a very good mood mm-hmm. all the time, apparently. Uh, Thomas Lennon, thank you so much for coming by. I really appreciate it. Congratulations on uh, The Odd Couple Thursday nights on CTV. Anytime. Pleasure. Thank you. Thank you so much. Pleasure. Thanks.